Romans chapter 1. We're going to kind of be throughout the book of Romans here, the majority of our time together today. But go ahead and grab them and start in Romans chapter 1 for me. I'm glad that you're here today. I see some of you that typically come to the first service and you decided that extra 15 minutes was just not worth it to you. So I just want to say welcome to the 11 o'clock. This is the rowdy service in case you were wondering. This is the people that slept in, had extra cups of coffee, and even had time to stop by the donut shop on the way in. So sugared up, caffeined up, and ready to go this morning. Amen? Amen. Some of you are still struggling to find your seat because you're trying, like, you don't know what happened to the chairs. And so you came in and you're like, what, what do I do? Wow, what, like you just looked absolutely lost. It was a lot of fun to watch. I just want to encourage you that through the trials and tribulations of life, God is still faithful Yes, your seat is not where it used to be, but I promise you, God will hold you and he will walk with you and he will support you as you find a new place to sit and you will do so with joy and gratitude for the things of God without grumbling or complaining. In Jesus' name, amen. Man, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm glad to, <laughs> uh, it's so funny when you move stuff around, it's, it's like, it was bewilderment on your faces, it was really fun to watch. Some of you don't like it, some of you do, um, either way, I'm glad you made it. Uh, if you look into the history of the church, we're going we're gonna to start a series on faith today, and uh, just look at what, what is faith, faith in our lives, faith as as believers, and um, as we start, uh, I, wanna, I just want to kind of go back and give a little bit of, of church history today. In the early 1500s, the, the Roman Catholic Church was really the center of everything, the center of cities, it was the center of even the government and, or, or the, the powers that be, um, and especially the center of religion. And uh, at that point, there had over the years, there had been a diversion and a, and a trend in some things that um, many had begun to criticize, saying that the, the Catholic Church had diverted from a, uh, from a biblical stance and viewpoint and, and, and actions uh, according to Scripture. And so they began to have some, some criticism from different uh, leaders of the day. Uh, one of the things that was particularly of interest was something called indulgences. Uh, indulgences were something that the Catholic Church would require or, or ask of, of people, uh, and they were monetary gifts or uh, uh, prices that could be paid, uh, whether in possessions or, or uh, treasure or sometimes even holy relics from the Holy Land. People would travel and gave these relics and bring them back and uh, gift them to the church. Uh, and, and the purpose of these in, indulgences were that uh, when one would pay an indulgence, they could shorten their time in purgatory and speed up their entrance into, the, into paradise, into the kingdom, or, or they could even be granted right standing and justification with God based on what they gave. Uh, and so uh, this was something that to those who uh, opposed was significant, and they began to push back on the Catholic Church and begin to push back. And in October, on October 31st, 1517, Martin Luther uh, went to a chapel in Wittenberg, Germany, and he nailed to the door a piece of paper that had the 95 Thesis, or basically a list of grievances that he had against the Catholic Church. Uh, this began what we know in church history as the Reformation. And uh, that list of grievances, one one. Uh, thing that kind of came out of that was something called the five solas. Um, uh, and the pivotal point in those five solas, one in particular, uh, was the sola sola fide, which simply means in faith alone. The, the point that Martin Luther was making was that in his study of the book of Romans and Paul's writing, he was saying, I don't see anything in scripture that says that I could buy my way, give my way, give enough indulgences for, or, or somehow earn justification or shorter uh, uh, sentencing of, of sin to somehow make myself or buy my way into right standing. Rather, 
uh, what Martin Luther was saying is that what I see in Scripture is that we are saved by grace through faith, period. And there's, there's nothing on our own merit, nothing in our own abilities, no works that we could possibly do that could uh, to help us in that. Rather, we are saved by faith alone, faith in Jesus Christ. Um, the scripture that kind of spurred this in him was Romans chapter 1, verse 17, and it says this. It's, uh, it's speaking about the gospel, and it says, For in it, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. And so when Martin Luther began studying this particular text, uh, he did so studying the original Greek rather than the Latin Bible that was most common at that point. And the Latin uh, translations versus the original Greek translations differed. And they, it, it opened up a whole new understanding and an, an interpretation of this text. In the Latin words, the, the righteousness that it's talking about was a righteousness that, was, um, uh, that, that we were made righteous, uh, that we were, we, we were made righteous through different things, through works or through uh, these things. And so that was kind of the Latin interpretation. But the actual Greek interpretation of righteousness and the justification here actually means that we were in, not made righteous, but we were regarded as righteous, that we were we were um, declared righteous. And so this idea of justification uh, that Martin Luther kind of discovered here in, in Paul's writings in Romans, what he was saying is, is that uh, we, the word just, justification and just would, would depict like if you could picture yourself in a courtroom. So God is the holy judge and he is perfect and he is sinless and he is full of grace and mercy but he is also just and he, he, there is no wiggle room when it comes to sin. And we stand before God as individuals and sinners caught red-handed in our sin, dead to rights. There's no question about it, we are sinners. We were caught, we were guilty. And yet in that courtroom with God as the just judge and us standing condemned, and the only penalty, the rightful penalty for that sin would be a, a death sentence. Jesus steps in, having never sinned, completely innocent. Jesus steps in, and instead of us receiving the death penalty, we were declared righteous. We were declared innocent. His righteousness was imputed or given unto us. And our death sentence was instead given to Jesus. Justification is, is that now we stand before God, not having earned anything, not having merited anything, not, not having uh, justified in any of our sin or our works or our abilities, but simply because of the perfect life of Jesus, we stand before God and we're declared and regarded as innocent, as though we had never sinned, and as though Christ had sinned all the sins that we did. It's a humbling thought, isn't it? So when Martin Luther read this scripture, this was what, what he claimed to be maybe, maybe like a, a, a true conversion experience for him. He, he said that uh, when I discovered that, I was born again of the Holy Ghost and the doors of paradise swung open and I walked through. Sola fide, faith alone, not my merit, not my abilities, not my works. Nothing that I could possibly do would be good enough to justify me, to, to cause me to be seen as innocent before God. Only Jesus. Only faith in Jesus. Romans chapter three, verse 21. The apostle Paul writes and he says, but now... Apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. See that again. This righteousness is given through what? Faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There's no difference between the Jew and the Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by what? 
Skip to verse 27. Where then is boasting? It is excluded because of what law? The law that requires works? No, because of the law that requires what? Faith. For we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Now, Paul was a very eloquent writer, and um, I'm from Arkansas, and so sometimes I'm less than eloquent. So sometimes, even in reading Paul's writings, I have, to, I have to work a little harder to truly understand what he's saying. And so I'm thankful for paraphrases and other interpretations that allow my simple-mindedness to understand the complexities of Scripture. So if it's okay with you, I'm sure that you guys are way more advanced than I am, but I'm going to read this text again in a paraphrase to help us, to help me understand a little better. Is that okay? It says this. We are made right with God by putting our faith in Jesus Christ. This happens to all who believe. It's no different for the Jews than for the Gentiles. Everyone has sinned. No one measures up to God's glory. The free gift of God's grace makes us right with him. Christ Jesus paid the price to set us free. Verse 27, so who can brag? No one. Are people saved by the law that requires them to obey? Not at all. They are saved because of the law that requires faith. We firmly believe that a person is made right with God because of their faith. Faith. As we open up this series and we begin over the next couple of weeks looking into the topic of faith and discovering what it is for our life, this is truly the starting blocks it's the, it's the starting point for faith is because we, uh, we are called people of faith, right? As we're even called believers, right? That we have faith and therefore we believe. And so uh, we're called, this is Christianity as a religion is known as a faith. Uh, we're, and so faith is something that we talk about a lot and it's something even that characterizes us that believe on Christ. And so uh, as we kind of explore this topic, I want to I begin with the thing that, that faith truly is the hinge that everything in Christianity swings upon. That this is, our faith is pivotal. It is primary in our life because it is only through faith, according to Scripture, that we are even saved. That outside of faith in Jesus Christ, we do not have salvation. And so if faith is such a primary topic, I think it's important for us to understand it at a little bit of a deeper level. And so today I want to talk about a saving faith, the faith that saves us. And I want to give us, uh, if you will, three components to a saving faith. Three components to a saving faith. I do not believe that faith is simply a blind leap into relationship with Jesus. I believe that a saving faith begins with knowledge of truth. It begins with knowledge of truth. None of you, if you are believers, stumbled into this on your own. None of you took a blind leap and found Christ on your own. Most likely, at some point in your life, you intersected with either information or someone along the way that shared with you the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. How many of you know exactly the person that shared with you the gospel? How many of you, maybe it was a Sunday school teacher as a child, or maybe it was a parent or someone in your workplace. Somewhere along the line, you were without the knowledge of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and someone introduced you to that knowledge, right? It begins, it, 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 faith begins in the knowledge of truth, an understanding of truth. That's what uh, the Apostle Paul was writing in chapter 10 when he said, how can they call on the one that they've not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they are, have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? That faith is a result of coming to and understanding and hearing the knowledge of truth. He says that on down in verse 17 where he says, So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Our faith is a result of our hearing and coming to the knowledge of truth. 
See, when we open up scripture, we see truth. We see that God is the creator, that God fashioned us and he formed us. We see the fall of man and we see that sin entered the world and separated us from God. We see the the narrative of scripture of of, of how the, the tendencies of man is to continue to walk away from God and his grace and his mercy and to be completely inept in the ability to walk with him and live with him without sin. And so we see that God remedy for this was that he loved us so much and wanted reconciliation with us so much that he sent his son into the world to then pay the penalty so that he could regard us as innocent and come back into relationship with him all so that his ultimate plan would work out and that we could be reconciled with him once again now here on this earth in spirit but soon in the in eternity eternity with him forever that is truth, and I know that because I have, uh, ex- I have ex- experienced the knowledge of it. I have come to it through God's Word. See, God's Word and understanding it and hearing it and listening to it and preaching it and, and, and memorizing it and studying it, these things are necessary to our faith. If you want to grow in your faith, grow in your relationship with the Word of God. If you want to grow a deeper faith, grow a deeper relationship with Scripture. Study it. Memorize it. Listen to it. Listen to preaching. Listen to teaching. Just go into the, into the depths of Scripture. And all it's going to do is just continue to expose to you the knowledge that will lead to more faith. Knowledge is the first step to faith. You want to see your, your kids become people of faith? And you should expose them early and often to the word of God. That's why Deuteronomy, it starts, it says, talk about it when you're going to bed. Talk about it when you're rising up. Write it on the doorpost of your house. Bind it on your wrist. Strap it on your foreheads. Do, when, you're, when you're going to eat, talk about it. When you're going out to work, talk about it. Everywhere that you go, these conversations of God's word should be infused in your life. The people around us should, should experience the word of God. Jesus is the word. He's inside of us. Therefore, when people encounter us and the Jesus inside of us, They should be encountering the word of God as it flows out of us and in the way that we're living our lives. And and faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The more that we teach it and study it and, and, and plant it deep in our hearts, the more our faith continues to grow. Teaching God's word in your home is key to your family's faith. Sharing your faith with people. Sharing the word of God in moments of their need. People are going through difficult times, share with them God's word. People are going through trouble in their family, share with them God's word. Share with them your life full of Jesus who is the word. This is key because the, all, through all of these things, people are being exposed to more knowledge and more knowledge of God's word builds faith. The second key The second component to faith is not enough just to know because there are people that know this book far more than I do but don't have a relationship with God. So if our faith stops at knowledge, is it faith? Or is it just knowledge? The second step is belief. The second component to a saving faith is not just that we know the word of God but that we believe the word of God. If you study the historicity of the scripture, from from the beginning to the end, it is faithful and it is true. Over and over and over again, it has proven to be the most accurate history book from from early years and through the gospels. Uh, Every critic, every person that's tried to debunk it over and over again has seen that it is actually extremely, extremely accurate. We believe, as people of faith and as believers, that it is the infallible, inspired word of God. And that, that it is perfect and that, that there are no errors in it. And the more that we put God's word in us and the more knowledge that we have, the second step then is that we begin to believe on it. That, that our, our faith moves from just knowing from our minds and our intellect to our hearts in believing that I understand that God created, that man fell, that Christ redeemed, 
and that ultimately will be glorified. I understand that, but now I believe that there is a God who created me, and it changes the way that I live. I believe that I am a person of sin, and that, that, that I, in my depraved nature, I will constantly sin. And I believe that, that I am not able to walk with God in the way that he designed. And I believe that, thank God, Jesus Christ came and he suffered and he died. But I also believe that he is risen again. And I believe that because of that, ultimately, this world is not my home and that I have eternity and promise and hope in heaven. And I believe that. It's not just that I know it and it's not just that it's information in my mind, but it is a core sense of belief about it, that it is true, that it is trustworthy, that it is faithful, that it is not wrong, but that over and over and over again, I could say that I believe God's word as true. Romans chapter 10, the Apostle Paul continues to write, and he says, if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. And as scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there's no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It's not enough to know. It's not enough just to have the information. It has to translate into belief in our life. That we take God's word as truth. I hear God's word and I believe it. I hear God loves me and I believe it. I see God's word and I believe it. And unfortunately, this is where many people stop. There's many people who have an intellectual knowledge of scripture and even a heart knowledge of knowing that the scripture is true and believing that the scripture is true, but that's where they stop. They know the truth, and they even believe the truth, but they haven't moved to the third component of a saving faith, which is trusting in the truth. Let me show you this. In the book of James, chapter two, James says this, he says, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food, and if one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is what? It's dead. You say, well, hold up, Pastor Chad, because just a few minutes ago, you were telling me that it's sola fide, faith alone. You were telling me that I don't have to try to work my way into that. There's no anything that I can add to this faith to be saved. And that, that you're saying that now you're saying that works or that faith without works is dead. Now, which is it? Hear me say this. And I, I, I want this on the screen because I'm going to say it, read from it. I'll just so make sure I get it correct. Faith is not a result of works, but it is expressed and works. Faith, our faith, our saving faith that justifies us before God, that makes us in right standing with God, that, that sees us be redeemed from sin, that saving faith is not a result of works. We cannot work our way into it. You can't live good enough. You can't obey enough rules. You can't be the perfect person enough. Even if you never sin from this point on in your life, you still would fall drastically short of the measuring stick of God's holiness. You can't do it. You can't work your way into a saving faith, but when you have a saving faith, when you have a knowledge of who God is and what He's done, and when you believe in your core that that's for you and that God loves you and that God's Word is true and that His promises are for you, for you, when you believe that, it will express itself 
in the way you live your life. It will express itself in good works. It will change the way that you parent your children. It will change the way that you interact with your spouse. It will change the way you lead your business. The sin and the patterns of the past will be gone. And it won't be because you're saying, God, I need to, I'm trying to find your approval. And God, I'm trying to be good enough. And God, I want you to, I want you to love me. It won't be that we're searching through good works for that redemption. It will be because we see ourselves in the courtroom standing there hopeless and condemned and deserving of death and we see the Son of God perfect and sinless who said I will take his penalty and you can give him new life set him free mark him innocent and it's because of that and that understanding that it changes the way that I live I live differently because I have knowledge of what God's done because I believe that it's true and his promises are true and now it informs the way that I walk my life is different my my faith now is expressed in works in the way that I live in the way that I talk in the way that I walk in the in the words that I say and the things that I take into my life and the things that I do and the things that I don't do I start living by God's word not because I'm trying to achieve the love of God but because I've received the love of God because I have seen the the passion and the love that he has for me and my only response is to stand there in thankfulness and gratefulness and say God anything you want my answer is yes Lord you paid that price my life is devoted to you I'll live by anything you say because I trust in you. I trust that your word is true. I trust that your way is right. I trust that your design for my family is right. I trust that what you say about me is true. And I trust that if I'm faithful to you and I walk with you, and that you're gonna, your plan is gonna unfold in my life. And I trust that my faith in you is ultimately going to see me through to the eternity and I'm gonna live forever with you. God, I don't do it out of seeking your approval. I do it, God, because I have been redeemed and I have been saved and I have been regarded as righteous in your eyes. My living shifts. The way that I live my life changes. Not because I'm good, but because I'm actually really bad and I didn't get penalized for it. But because I've been made brand new, I've been given a fresh, a new lease on life. And now I'm just like, God, I refuse to go back to that old thing. I'm living for you. My faith expresses itself in works. My faith expresses itself in the way that I live.